Yeah, where there's a bit of moisture. Down on the flat at another of Bruce's farms near the beach, the land is made up of sand. Also peat, which, once it dries out, is very hard to get to take water up again. Peat's not the sponge, we think. Well, this is typical of Northland up here, where you've got peat and sand and volcanic soils, so they're a lot lighter, and so the water holding capacity is a lot less than the clays, so they're just going off a lot faster. Um, and normally this sort of country would go well into December, um, and as you can see, it's, it's actually just, it's gone now. It's all weed, really, isn't it? It's all weed, yeah. While farmers look to insulate themselves from another dry summer, even drought, to Bruce's north at Ruatangata, one bright young spark has come up with a water-saving device for the milking shed, and he's got a lot of support. 23-year-old Julian Retikoko has come up with an alternative to the method of spraying water on a cow's face to get her to back out of the bale after she's finished milking. It's a yellow pad called Move Off, which flicks towards the cow's face, pushed forward by a pneumatically driven arm. I've seen all this water going down the drain, John, and I thought to myself, you know, there must be a better use for this water yeah. other than ending up in the effluent pond. So that's basically where I came up with the idea to stop using that water, and that's when the Move Off came to me. So how much water do you reckon you'd save a farmer each day? Uh, in, in my shed, I was milking a 1,000 cows, I was quite a large herd and I was using an average of 6,000 litres a day. But in New Zealand, the sheds range from 20 bales right up to 120. So you can save a farmer between 1,500 litres right up to 9,000 litres easy every single day. So how does it work? Is it a squirt of compressed air instead of water or is it more the movement of the, the yellow pad there? Uh, it's definitely more the movement. Yeah, if you put anything in a cow's face, a cow's going to walk backwards no matter what. Sort of the same reaction if I was to you know, give you one in the face, John, yeah, yeah. you'll move back, and that's exactly what the move off does. Like all good ideas, this invention is simple and it seems to work. And that's probably why Julian had no trouble quickly getting a backer on board to help him develop his machine. When I came up with the move off idea, it didn't look too flash on a piece of paper, but I believed in the concept and what it could do, and I just backed myself to the, you know, to the fullest and I, I, I rang around and I, I got a hold of Joe Ross from Northland Metal Industries and I just basically said, Joe, I've got an idea. Uh, are you interested in hearing, hearing me out? And we arranged the meeting and he liked what he's seen from me. So over the course of one to two months, we basically uh, got together, draw, came up with a blueprint and then uh, we ended up installing the prototype over here. So it happened pretty quick. Yeah, I've had a lot of interest and um, I've only been going for a week and I've had um, two, three people ring me up every single day, so that's huge for me. Julian Retikoko has got a whole raft of other ideas for inventions for farmers, having been a dairy farmer himself after doing part of an engineering degree. And he's quickly learned the all-important rules of commercial secrecy. All my ideas revolve around farming, be it sheep, beef or dairy farming, it's my main passions. But yeah, my, my next idea is a bit of a hush-hush at the moment there, John, but um, <laughs> it'll definitely I'd like to show you before I tell you about it. That's, that's, that's basically what I know, that's my motto. Meantime, as threatening clouds refuse to oblige with rain, Northland farmers and many in other parts, such as Nelson, the Waikato, and Taranaki, pray for the heavens to open soon. Welcome back. Next up, I talk to climate scientist Georgina Griffiths of Niwa, who will bring us up to date with Niwa's latest rainfall predictions in the current La Nina weather pattern. Well, Georgina, welcome back to the Sector Report here in the studio. Nice to see you again for what is turning into a bit of a regular weather update. Now, we're in the La Nina weather pattern as we head into the summer. How does La Nina work and how is it different from its brother El Nino? Okay, well I think we sort of need to take a big picture back and think about how do, how do we measure La Nina, how do we know what's going on? Mm. Well it's your, it's your barometer back to basics and also um, far into the future it's from the satellite. 
Um, so from your barometer, it's about Tahiti, actually. It's the Eastern Pacific. Mm -hmm. So that semi-permanent high that lives around Tahiti tends to be very strong, very intense during the La Nina event. What that does is um, cause the trade winds, those easterly winds that blow across the Pacific, mm -hmm. um, to be more intense. And um, the net result that you can see from a satellite uh, is a really large area of much colder than normal water around right. the equator. And mm -hmm. it stretches what's called the cold tongue, stretches all the way across from South America through to the Indonesian region. So right. it's a really easy thing to see from a satellite, mm -hmm. a bird's eye view, extremely cold, and, and that's the La Nina. The El Nino is the reverse, so what we call the warm tongue. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's it's La Nina that, that we're with at the right moment. Right now, yeah. that's right. Yeah. We'll get on to the spin-off of, of that in, in a second, but let's go straight to just what's happening right now. You've just published your November summary and, and the seasonal outlook. How is it actually looking? I suppose it depends a bit on where you're farming. OK, so we are seeing La Nina impacts for New Zealand mm. now. I mean, we get a flow-on effect from what's happening in the tropics, sort of mm. migrates down like a bit of a domino effect to New Zealand. Right. So what we see for New Zealand during the La Nina is a lot more easterly or northeasterly winds, particularly over the North Island. And we see a, a, a funny pattern where instead of for summer having highs sitting over the North Island, mm. they, they tend to be further south and further east, so really um, prevalent around the South Island. So it's kind of a flip-flop of what we would typically see at this time of year. And mm. we've seen a very anticyclonic flavour recently, so much higher than normal pressures, no surprise to farmers there. Mm. And the, the um, net result, obviously, since the last six or seven weeks, October and November, being very dry. Thinking about November, that climate summary we've just issued, mm. record warm for the entire South Island. Temperatures two or three degrees warmer than normal for much of the South right. Island, about a degree warmer than normal for many areas of inland North Island. Mm. That's a La Nina thing. La Nina brings a lack of southerly, more northerly or easterly, so mm. warm, that flavour of warm is right. a real, really standard La Nina response. Yeah, I think Nelson has come as a, a little bit of a surprise to me. I mean, I think it's at about 10% of normal November. Like rainfall levels, would that be right? I mean, a lot of the country actually in the north and west of mm. both islands, less than 25% of normal. Right. Record dry um, Hamilton, you know, and, and even wet, wet and windy old Taranaki. Is, yes, yeah. Taranaki broke, broke uh, record dry November. Taupo, um, mm. places like Wanganui, Waiuru, and also into Nelson, central Otago, very dry. Murchison, I think, recorded one millimetre in the month. Really? Yes, two millimetres in that sort of lakes district, so mm. extremely dry November. Um, the only unusually dry for all areas apart from Northland, obviously, last year. Mm. They, they also were, were extremely dry the start yeah. of the previous drought, so they were drier the previous year. Mm. Yeah, the interesting thing with La Nina too, though, is that you expect it to, to comply with your, your sort of generalised picture of it, um, so that it is, you think, going to be fairly wet in the north and the east, particularly of the North Island. Yet here we are um, with two months of very low rainfall. Yes, Auckland Northland hasn't yeah. quite done the, the typical La Nina thing um, so far. The expectation for the summer period, the seasonal, mm. is still for the La Nina impact, which is wetter in the north and east coastally, right. to kick in in the summer season. Mm. Um, that, I mean, the key, it, what typically happens in a La Nina and what's aligned to what we're forecasting is very dry in the west and south of the South Island, so those highs really impacting well below normal rainfall and soil, uh, soils there. Mm. And slightly wetter on those eastern areas between East Cape uh, North Cape and also into Gisborne Hawke's Bay. But you know we have this dry slot in the western mm. North Island with the La Nina, it's what we're forecasting again. So say Pukekohe South right. or you know the Waikato, Tamaranui, Ruapehu type district where we've seen that dryness start to occur with the Easterlies. Obviously mm. in the lee of um, substantial ranges like the Kaimais or Central Plateau or the, even mm. um, further down. So you know in the rain shadow, shadow there so unlikely to be um, dripping wet I guess in summer in those regions. Mm. Now, let's look further, perhaps, into next year. Um, but before we do, I, I'm sorry, I'll just, I'll just confirm it with you that we can, that Northlanders can expect a reversion to the normal La Nina pattern. So they should get a bit of rain come Christmas time? Yes, the outlook mm. for the north and east of the North Island yeah. is normal or above normal rainfall. The exception, um, when you talk about northern regions, yeah. is Waikato South. Right. Taranaki should pick up some normal rainfalls for the summer season. Well, they'll be relieved. Yeah. Yes, but I mean, we're looking at um, you know a 90-day period and looking at weather progs, you know, mm. the normal numerical weather prediction models, I don't think it's imminent. 
it's not going to be overnight short term. No. Uh, the first half of December does look to remain extremely warm mm. and pretty dry. So over the season, yes, we expect some relief in Northland and places like Coromandel Bay, Plenty, Gisborne, mm. um, even Taranaki. But I don't, I don't think it's going to happen imminently. No. And um, it may be a case of a little bit too late, you know, for the farming community. Mm. Yeah, um, but from the talking around I've been able to do up north anyway, they have taken the necessary precautionary measures, many farmers, and allowed for more water storage, getting their crops in a bit earlier and, okay. and so on. So. Well, actually also they had very healthy winter rainfalls Indeed. in Northland and Auckland, yeah. um, which is, a, a, I guess, a bit different to, to the previous setup we had last year with the El Nino. It had been a fairly dry winter yeah. period before the very dry November. Yeah, that's, that's right. Now, just fairly briefly, let's look further into next year. What, what can farmers and growers expect once we hit autumn and winter? Well I guess key messaging, this is a moderate to strong, it's a pretty intense La Nina now. Mm -hmm. It's likely to continue all the way through summer and it's into the autumn, although we are expecting it to, to, weigh, to wane, to ease mm -hmm. as we move into autumn. So I think it's still going to be here by March, may well not be here, we might be into the neutral territory by May. So w when we, we're in neutral territory, what does that mean for us through, through the winter? Um, when winter patterns set up and other drivers, not El Nino, not La Nina are important during winter. Um, the El Nino La Nina, it's a summer thing. It's, it's mm. when it peaks and it's impacts and magnitude here. Winter, we're going to start looking south of the country. What are the, the temperatures down south? What are the westerlies doing? So we, we don't know what winter looks like yet, but we're going to be looking south for winter. Mm. Mm. But in the meantime, at least until we, until we get to that, and I, I know it's, it's crystal ball territory, but in the meantime, La Nina is fairly well, fairly firmly entrenched is what you'd say. Oh yes, this is a much more uh, dominant climate feature than the La Nina we had in 2007 and 8. It's a lot stronger, this event. Right. And 2007 and 8, um, we got some fairly severe drought, didn't we? Yes, and that Waikato, the dry spot mm. south. So, I mean, it's, there's no guarantee of a drought in that region, but the no. odds would say a drier period from now on in that region. Mm. Um, that's the only area in a La Nina in autumn that remains dry. The rest of the country wettens up quite nicely. So you've got to remember, El Nino and La Nina impacts for New Zealand, they're quite seasonal in nature. Mm. Mm. You know, a summer, summer La Nina impact in the west and south of the South Island is screaming dry, yeah. and by the time you get to autumn it's quite wet yeah mm. yeah exactly oh well um, I, I suspect that uh, your your uh, forecast will bring some comfort to to farmers particularly up north as yes they, let's as hope for Northland indeed yeah okay well look, thanks very much for coming into the studio and, and for your time this morning I know you've got a very busy week <laughs> so thanks for that Georgina you're welcome climate scientist Georgina Griffiths of Niwa there well that's our show Remember, you can catch up with Sector Report and a whole lot else on our website. Catch you next time.